in this room. And the next speaker up is uh, Jasmin Blanchet. He is the co-author of the Cute book, the official Cute book, and he's going to talk about plugins. <laughs> Thanks. Oh, yeah, Mike is working. Cool. Okay. One second. OK, yes, uh, welcome to this presentation. Uh, this is about plugins, about uh, how to make your application extensible through plugins, uh, but also how to extend Qt and Qt Designer using plugins. So it'll be kind of in three parts. Um, so first, some background. In Qt3, we had uh, some plugins for Qt and Qt Designer, so there was a possibility of adding some fun functionality to the Qt library through uh, plugins, uh, especially for image formats and such things, for uh, SQL drivers, uh, custom styles, uh, and other such components. And also in Qt Designer, there was the uh, possibility of integrating a custom widget in Designer, already in Qt3. What we lacked back then was a general framework uh, for doing plugins in the application. So a general mechanism that would enable you uh, to load plugins in your application to make your own application extensible through plugins. And this is new in Qt4. We finally have such a mechanism, such a framework in place for doing that. So this will be the first uh, and the focus of the presentation today. So when doing that, uh, I'll present three examples. Uh, the plugin paint application is an application that's part of the Qt4 uh, example directory. So it's already there. So you might have seen it already. Um, it's a painter application that has different brushes and different image filters provided as plugins. Um, then the second application I'm going to talk about a bit is uh, a, um, an image handler uh, to show how to extend Qt with plugins. Uh, this application will be part of the next edition of the Qt book, uh, which is due next uh, summer, probably. Uh, and finally, there's the uh, tic-tac-toe widget, which will be part of Qt 4.1, so, uh, which is coming in a couple of weeks. Uh, and this is to show how to integrate a custom widget in Designer and how to provide some custom behavior, custom menus, and, and so on. So first, plugins. Who uses plugins? Uh, actually, you're probably using plugins without necessarily being aware of it because lots of applications use, use them. Um, usually, it's, uh, it's very common for graphical applications, uh, for image filters, for example, uh, or to support file formats. So uh, web browsers use uh, plugins for different components like Flash uh, and so on. So this is just a short list of existing applications, popular mass market applications that use some kind of plugins. But what is a plugin, really? Uh, a plugin, a dynamic library, what's the difference? When, when do you start calling something a plugin? Um, basically, a plugin is a dynamic library that meets certain criteria. Uh, the criteria are listed here. Uh, first, it has to be explicitly loaded by the application. So this happens at runtime. Uh, this happens, doesn't happen uh, at link time, or it doesn't happen at startup. Uh, it happens at some point while the application is running, uh, maybe just after the startup, but still uh, it happens at runtime. Uh, and then, second criterion is that it implements certain interfaces. So, um, what is meant by that is that you can have several plugins, you can have uh, 50 different plugins all implementing the same interfaces, and then they'll be picked up by the application and be available as 50 different options or 50 different uh, features uh, of the product. So you can always add a plugin uh, to an application, and it doesn't replace any existing functionality. It always adds functionality, uh, as opposed to a general DLL, which could do anything. It could uh, be an essential part of the application. Uh, or maybe it could not handle several at the same time, or etc. So this is fundamental idea of the plugin, the idea you could just add plugins to applications. Uh, so that was criteria two and three actually combined. Yes. So the plugin framework we have in, in Qt4 uh, follows this general high-level uh, schema, which is that the application defines a set of interfaces, 
And these interfaces, these classes, uh, are those that are used to communicate with the plugin um, dynamically at runtime. And then, uh, so you define these interfaces in a header file. And then the application attempts to load some dynamic libraries that are located on the file system using a class that's called QPluginLoader. And once the application has loaded these plugins, uh, the application can use the uh, interfaces that it has defined to access these, to access, uh, to access the functionality implemented by the plugin. Finally, the plugin providers uh, implement their own plugins by inheriting, by deriving from the interface classes that were defined by the application, and by adding their own functionality there. So I'm going to show all of that in detail with some code. Finally, this is, the, uh, this is a Qt4 framework for plugins, but you can totally bypass it and simply use QLibrary if you want. Uh, QLibrary is a low-level class for loading libraries dynamically and resolving symbols in libraries. Uh, so that's always a door that's open if, you're, if for some reason you don't want to use the, uh, the plugin framework. And that was, already, that was the only option available in Qt3 for plugins. So the first step is to define uh, some interfaces uh, to communicate between the plugin and the application. So how it works is like this. Um, you declare a class that has only pure virtual functions. And this is important because communicating to, with a plugin is not uh, done by resolving C++ or C symbols. It's done by accessing a virtual table. So it's done, it's done dynamically by calling a function to its pointer and therefore, you need virtual functions to, uh, to achieve that. Um, so basically, you declare one or several interface classes. Um, and these classes are identified by a string. Uh, to, and this string is used by Qt to identify the, uh, the plugin, uh, the interface in a unique fashion. So this way, you can make sure that if you change the, uh, the class in some way, you add a function, you change the signature or something, you can change the string that is associated to the interface, and then you're certain that plugins that implement the old interface won't collide with plugins that in implement the, the new interface, uh, or vice versa. So the string typically has the form that's given there, so name of your company, name of the application, the name of the class, and the version number. And that's what we use internally for our own uh, interfaces in Qt as well, so com.trolltech. QT, et cetera. And what is cool is that we have Mock, everybody's favorite uh, program that uh, generates meta information based, uh, that contains those ID strings. So everything is handled behind the scene without having to do anything. We just say, oh, we declare this interface. We associate this string to it. And later on, we just try to load uh, the class, we don't need to specify this string more than once. We specify it only in one place in the code, and then uh, Qt will generate it in the proper places and make sure that everything fits, and if it doesn't, uh, you get the null pointer back telling you that the plugin doesn't implement the interface that you are trying to load. Uh, so this is the beauty of having Muck taking care of those silly details. You just have to enter the string once. So let's see an example with the Plug and Paint application. Um, plug and Paint has three interfaces. I'm just going to show one of uh, class declarations here. It's all, it's all more or less the same. So uh, the class is called Filter Interface. It consists only of uh, pure virtual functions. So it has a filters function and the filter image function. And it also has a, a destructor, virtual destructor to silence the compiler, but that's not relevant to the application here. And um, so let's go to the filters function. Filters here is a uh, function that returns a list of uh, strings. And these strings identify the filters uh, provided by a plugin. So what this enables is that a single plugin can provide several features or several filters in this case uh, without having to uh, provide several plugins, so you can implement 10 filters in one plugin, uh, or you can arrange them how you want. 
so the function filters here returns a list of keys in a way, and then all the other functions, in this case there's only one, it's called filter image, takes one of these keys as its first parameter. Uh, so, th so that's a typical pattern, and we'll see more examples of that later. Uh, so if you want to filter an image, you specify which filter you want to apply. Is it a blur filter? Is it a sharpen filter? And so on. And then you pass the image, uh, and then you get an image back. So notice at the bottom, there's, the, there's a special macro there that it associates the uh, string, the identifier string, to the uh, class name. So uh, again, if we change the interface in some way, we make sure that we also change the string there, and then everything will be fine. So after we've defined the interfaces, the second step is to load the plugins from the application. So this is not done automatically. This is something you need to do uh, using QDIR, for example. You just browse through a directory. Uh, for example, the plugins directory of your application or of your bundle on Mac. And you use QPlugin Loader uh, to load the plugins with the contents of that directory. And uh, then finally, step number three is to use QObject Cast. Uh, basically, what happens is that a plugin is basically just a Q object. It's a Q object that inherits multiply from Q object, but also from all the interfaces that it provides. For example, the filter interface. So we use the Q object cast. Uh, function, uh, which is a bit like a dynamic cast, to uh, test whether a plugin implements a certain interface. And if it does, what, what we get is a p valid pointer back to that interface. And if the plugin doesn't implement the right interface or the right version of the interface, then what we get back is a null pointer. So we'll see some code uh, shortly. That's okay. So this is a typical uh, code that you'd have in maybe the constructor of your uh, application's main window, where you iterate through the contents of a directory, and you use QPlugin Loader to try to load the different uh, files that are in there that we assume are plugins. So in this case, uh, first thing we do, we use QPlugin Loader, then we call the function uh, instance to return a Q object that represents a plugin. So if this function returns a valid pointer. It means what we have is a valid Qt plugin that links against the correct version of Qt, a compatible version of Qt. Um, and then afterwards, we use QObject Cast to try to see which interfaces it implement. And the result of that we can then use to access the plugin. By the way, if you have uh, oh, questions or at the end, I guess, yeah. So if you have questions at the end, um, I was going to point out that you could ask questions at any time, but I guess it doesn't work in such a big room. So if you don't understand, just make signs, and I'll try to re-explain it, I guess. Uh, that might work. So uh, step number three is uh, actually creating the plugins. Uh, it's not enough just to define interfaces and try to use them. You also, somebody at some point will have to create those plugins, uh, and this is how it's done. Um, and again, it relies on some help from Mock, and we've got those crazy macros. Um, and you'll see at the end of this talk, you'll be convinced that uh, writing plugins with Qt or making your application extensible with Qt is simply a matter of putting the five correct macros in the right places and crossing your fingers. And the most important part of that, of course, is to cross the fingers. Uh, but in general, it works, yeah. So um, that's the joy of plugins. So uh, how do you create your own plugins? You start by subclassing QWidget, subclassing deriving from Q, Q object, sorry, and all the interfaces you want to implement. Uh, step number two is you need to use a special macro to tell Mock that you want to generate some meta information. Uh, Mock could pick up it by, could almost pick it up by itself, but it doesn't want to generate needless information about uh, classes that aren't going to be used by plugins. So therefore, we force users to specify, hey, this third base class here is actually an interface class. So please, Mark, generate some information for me uh, that will be used to double check that it's the right version of the plugin. Then later in the file, somewhere in some file, 
you need an entry point for your plugin. So it's a bit the equivalent of a main function, but it's, uh, it's a plugin, so it's not a main. It's a special function that creates an instance of the plugin. So an instance of that class that we are defining. Uh, so we just use the, the macro does it for us. It declares actually, it declares and defines two functions uh, for us. And finally, we need an appropriate profile, QMake profile to build the plugin or to create an appropriate make file otherwise. So here's an example of a plugin that, uh, that implements three interfaces. So it implements a brush interface, the shape interface, and the filter interface uh, for the plugin paint application. Uh, so we see that it has a multiple inheritance at the top. Uh, it has the Q interfaces macro to identify which of these base classes are uh, actual interfaces for which you want to generate meta object code. And finally, it got a whole, got a whole bunch of functions that we re-implement from the interface classes. So I've only shown three, like one from each, uh, that shows that all three classes follow the same pattern of having one function that returns a string list of all the features supported by the plugin or the interface, uh, and then other functions that take one of these strings as first parameter. And here you've got some implementation of some of these functions just to show how it works. So the filters function here, there are three filters implemented by this plugin, uh, invert pixel, swap RGB, and grayscale. And the filter image function takes a filter's first parameter and it checks which filter is being passed and it does the appropriate uh, uh, things with the parameters based on that. And at the end, the important thing is queue export plugin, because otherwise it won't work, which is why you have to cross your fingers. So this is the profile. Uh, the lines in blue are those that are slightly different from usual. So first, it's not an application. It's a library. Uh, so you have to tell uh, QMake uh, that it's a library. Template equals lib. But not only it's, it's a library, it's also a plugin library, which means certain things for QMake. Uh, for example, on, on Linux, I've noticed one difference is that it doesn't generate uh, lots of sim links with different version numbers in them back to the plugin. It only generates one file. Uh, apart from that, it might have other effects. I don't know. It might even be documented. Um, then there's the uh, include path. Uh, we need to include one header where we have all these uh, interfaces definitions that belongs to another application. Uh, so here I'm rela relying on certain structure of my directory system, so it happens to be two levels up and, and so on, but it, doesn't, it depends on the application. Uh, and finally, at the end, destination. Uh, in this case, I just said, oh, just put it directly in the source directory uh, for the application, so it's already there when I run it. But in real life, you might put it in your installer or, or something, so it's, this line can change, or it's not necessarily uh, necessary. So what happens under the hood, uh, that's always a bit interesting to know what, what's going on. Um, QExport plugin defines two functions. The important one is Q plug, Q plugin instance, which creates an instance of that class that is our plugin. Uh, but there's also another function that Q uses internally to check that the plugin is linking against uh, the correct version of Q, a compatible version of Q. Uh, so a version that is not uh, younger than the version against which the application was built. And the Q interfaces macro uh, expands to nothing, so just something that Mug picks up. So what are the benefits of using that framework as opposed to uh, using Q library directly? Uh, it's basically crash safety and convenience. Uh, Q plugin loader checks the Qt version for us. Uh, Q object cast checks that it's the uh, correct interfaces, the correct version of the interfaces, and so on. Um, and thanks to the ID string, we have a guarantee that we won't have collisions because two different companies have a plugin, uh, an interface called filter interface. So you don't have to worry about giving like very long names to your variables or to your class names. You just 
have to make sure that your ID is, is unique by using your domain name uh, and the application name. And the convenience is the fact that IDs, you just need to specify them once, and they're handled by Mock and by the, the whole plugin framework. And that you don't need to resolve any C function manually. Uh, you just have macros that do that for you and functions. So you don't need to cast anything apart from the uh, dynamic casts that, uh, that are done with QObject cast. OK, so this was the first part. Uh, how to extend your application. You said it was fairly straightforward. Uh, so now we're going to go into specifics of how this applies to Qt plugins, uh, those plugins that extend Qt itself. And uh, there are some things that are a bit different because the Qt plugins are slightly more high level. Um, they were created already in Qt 3, and we've kept more or less the same high level interface. And internally, they're implemented on top of the mechanisms that we just saw. Uh, and the advantage of this is that it's easier for, uh, for people to get started uh, writing cute plugins using those high-level nice classes without having to worry about all those macros. Uh, but then when the day they want to create their own applications and have to learn, of course, the, the stuff that I presented earlier. So uh, yes, Qt defines several interfaces. Uh, but these interfaces are internal. Um, they're used behind the scenes, but you don't have to worry about them. Uh, instead, what you have is that you have plugin-based classes uh, that have plugin in their name. So you have a whole series of classes in Qt, uh, Q-style plugin, uh, image IO plugin, I believe, and so on. We'll see the class names later. Um, so those already in the read from QObject already inherit from some interface class that is not documented, that is internal. Um, and they do all the magic for us uh, with the Q underscore interface macro. The only macro we still need is the Q export plugin macro to have an entry point in our uh, library. Uh, one drawback of this approach is that we cannot implement multiple interfaces in one single plugin because the multiple inheritance already done for us and we don't have access to the interfaces. Uh, but in practice, it's not a real problem with Qt plugins. Uh, you don't, I would not see like a plugin providing a uh, SQL database driver and an image format at the same time. It sounds a bit strange, so it's not, it's not a real big limitation, I believe. Here are the uh, plugin types in Qt 4. So in Qt 3, we had five. In Qt 4, we have twice that amount, and I'm not even talking about the, uh, oh yes, I am. That includes the uh, Qt Embedded or Qtopia Core uh, plugin classes that provide certain um, handlers for uh, input uh, devices, for example. So interesting ones in that list, I would say you have the image IO plugin uh, for adding file formats uh, in addition to PNG, JPEG, and so on. You have the style plugin, so you can create uh, your custom styles and provide them uh, dynamically to the application. And uh, you have Codex as well for uh, encoding and decoding uh, um, different encodings, like, like you, I mean, not Unicode, but uh, EUCGP or, or, or Latin uh, 19, or I don't know. So, um, yeah. So I'll go with the example of an image plugin, which is probably the most common example, uh, that reads a very strange file format, is a Windows cursor file format, uh, which are like the old format just had black and white cursors with possibility for transparency and, and XOR. Um, but they can store several images in one single uh, file, which is a bit interesting. But I'm not going to go into that, those details today. That will be explained in the Qt book more in detail. Uh, so I'm going to stick to the uh, plugins aspect of it. Okay. So this is how it works. We have three functions that we need to implement. The first one is called keys. Uh, it could have been called uh, formats to represent the fact that these are image formats. Uh, but since we're not using multiple inheritance anyway, 
we don't have to worry about having several functions called keys. But I highly recommend when you define your interfaces uh, to use a less generic name, uh, like names like shapes or filters or, or um, pens that I used later, earlier were much better than a name, generic name like keys, which might be used by several interfaces at the same time. And then you, it's impossible to re-implement all of them at the same time without using some clever tricks. Then we have the capabilities function we have to re-implement to, to describe what are the possibilities we have for certain formats, the capabilities, the, uh, whether it's read-only, read-write, write-only, uh, and so on. Um, and you notice the file format is passed as second argument, not first, so it's a bit different from the pattern we've seen earlier. So that's because of historical reason. And then finally, there's create. The create function uh, creates a queue image IO handler, which is the class that really implements all the logic for supporting a file format. So the advantage then is that you can create 10 different queue image IO handler subclasses uh, in 10 different files, 10 different totally independent code bases, and then you can join them into one plugin uh, using the cursor plugin class here. So by splitting between the interface for reading and writing a file, uh, an image file, and the interface for exporting that as a plugin, uh, you get much more flexibility, uh, much more, a much cleaner code base. Uh, so it's a pattern you might want to reproduce in your own applications, which we didn't do earlier in the plugin paint application. So we just, if we supported three filters, we would just implement them there uh, instead of having this special handler class. So this pattern of having a handler class is uh, typical of Qt uh, plugin architecture, so how to extend Qt. So if I go back one slide, uh, you see the classes on the right are always the kind of handler classes, uh, and you see that the, the pattern is more or less systematically followed in Qt. So for a queue accessible plugin, there's a queue accessible interface class that is really the, the handler uh, for that plugin, and then you can have, if you export 10 different um, interfaces, you can all put them in one plugin. Uh, so this is how we handle the, uh, the uh, multiplexing. Okay. And here we see the create function as an example. So uh, if the format is something, we just create the handler, and all the logics is in the, the handler. And then at the end, we have the, the infamous macro, the queue export plugin entry point, which is very important. That's the same slide. The, uh, <laughs> is, is it there twice for real? No, okay. The profile is very similar to what we did earlier, except that this time we have to put the plugins into Qt's directory. So we use the uh, Qt dir. In this case, I just call it Qt dir with uh, assuming there was an environment variable set to that, uh, slash plugins, slash image formats. So different types of plugins have to go in different directories into Qt's uh, plugins directories. Uh, and image formats have to be in image formats, otherwise they won't be recognized by Qt. They won't be picked up. OK? The third part is how to extend Qt Designer with plugins. So Designer itself has its own architecture for uh, being extensible, for, for being extended by plugins, uh, especially because you want to integrate your custom widgets in Designer, but also because you might want to add some or tweak some feature of Designer. Um, so we've got interfaces for doing that. And in Qt4, it's much more powerful than Qt3, uh, which means that you can have uh, multiple widgets, multiple custom widgets, a bit like QStack widget, or QTab widget, and you can support them fully through plugins and integrate them a bit like if they were built-in widgets in Qt. So uh, these classes were very poorly documented in 4.0, um, but in 4.1, the good news is that we have proper documentation and several examples that show how to use the classes, at least the classes that are named here. So I really recommend anybody who's trying to do something crazy with Qt Designer to wait until for one and look at the documentation there uh, instead of trying to read the undocumented 
functions and see how they work together and asking support. And uh, yeah, that's my recommendation. So most important classes, the first class is yeah, Q Designer Custom Widget Interface um, is the one that you use to uh, integrate a custom widget in Designer. So you provide the name of the class and you provide a way to create the class, tool tips for it, etc., etc. More or less the same way as you did in Q3, uh, except that the class name was a bit shorter, I think, in Q3. Then um, we have the Q Designer ext Container Extension, uh, which is a class you use when you want to support multi page widgets. So the trick with Qt Designer and Qt4 is we have one extension, one class that you absolutely have to implement. Uh, that's the first one that's listed there. And then if you want, you can implement some of the other classes, the extension classes, to provide extra, extra capability around that widget. So then there's a task menu extension. And this is if you want to alter the uh, context menu that shows up when you right click on your custom widget. So you can have like shortcuts if you want to um, change some properties of the widget. Uh, you can add them into that list. You have the member sheet extension and the property sheet extension, which are for configuring the, the different uh, dialogues, the, uh, the member uh, sheet apparently in the property uh, editor in Qt Designer. So you can hide some properties, you can create fake properties, you can basically have a layer between your widget and Qt Designer. So the examples that the, the example that demonstrates demonstrates that will be part of 4.1 in the uh, examples slash designer directory, and it's called uh, Tic Tac Toe. And here's a brief overview of the classes that are involved. So first, you have a widget that's called Tic Tac Toe. That's the widget we want to integrate in Designer. And the, uh, the one interesting thing it has is it's got a state property, uh, which can be something like XOXOXO hyphen hyphen X, uh, which encodes the state of the tic-tac-toe widget. Then we have tic-tac-toe dialog, which is a small dialog that allows you to enter a state for the, uh, for the, the tic-tac-toe widget. So it has a tic-tac-toe widget in the middle, and it has an OK cancel button, and you can just and pro probably a reset button, and then you can just click to uh, set a default state for, for the game. So that dialog is not really useful in real life, but it will be useful for integrating it in Designer, because that will be one way to edit that property, the state property, instead of manually typing XO, 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 etc. Then there's a plugin class that makes it available, of course, to Designer, as usual. And then we have two other subclasses that uh, deal with different extensions. So uh, there's the task menu, uh, the tic-tac-toe task menu class, which adds one entry to the uh, con context menu. And finally, there's the extension factory class, which is a kind of requirement when we deal with designer. Uh, we have to implement a uh, we have to implement an extension factory. I'll show it in code. Uh, it's a bit boring, but we have to do it. So what does our plugin look like? It's, uh, it's very typical, again. We inherit from QObject. We inherit from an interface class. In this case, it's Q Designer Custom Widget Interface. And then we use a Q Interfaces macro again to tell Mock about this class. Uh, so it's all the same, really, designer is just one application like any other, like your own application. Uh, so it's the same mechanism to write plugins for it. And then we implement a whole series of uh, functions. And uh, in this case, you can only define one custom class at a time. There is no function that lets you return a string list. Uh, if you want to do that, there's this another class that's called Q Designer Custom Widget Collection Interface or something like that. Uh, so the name is a bit longer. And uh, that one allows you to create several custom widgets. So I did not show it today to keep the talk simple. Then we have the uh, task menu, which is an extension. So it's uh, 
It has its, uh, it's also a kind of uh, plugin. And um, this one inherits from Q Designer Task Menu Extension, uh, the class that we need to implement to, uh, to subclass to add support for this uh, custom menu, the fact that we want to have an extra entry in there. And the functions we need to implement are simply uh, task actions, which is a list of actions that we want to add to the menu, and a default action uh, that we want to be invoked, I think, when you double click or something like that. Then we have the factory, that's a boring part that we have to do, uh, where we have to, uh, basically this is a different pattern that belongs only to designer, where we have to uh, subclass to extension factory and re-implement create extension. So we'll see a bit later. But this is basically copy-paste. Whenever you need a, a special extension, you basically always need this code. So the profile is very similar to the usual thing, except that this time we also link against the Qt Designer library, not only to uh, Qt. So this time the config line has designer in it. And the destination directory is the uh, designer subdirectory of the of Qt's plugin directory. Uh, yeah, the special code that was in create extension is not shown here, probably because it's too ugly. So uh, we won't see it. So in conclusion, uh, Qt4 has this uh, general plugin architecture that you can use in your own applications, and uh, that will make some of your users happy. But one other case where you might want to use plugin is to simply to make your code more modular. Uh, I know some companies who, for testing reasons, uh, like to use plugins or dynamic libraries so they keep their modules apart and make sure that they don't, uh, uh, that they don't have to test the entire application when they make one change in one uh, plugin, for example. Then, uh, and in Qt4, just like in Qt3, you can create plugins, of course, for Qt and Qt Designer, so there's a whole series of things you can do. So if you're more interested about plugins, uh, I'll point you to documentation. First, there's the uh, plugins how-to, which is a big document that explains uh, exactly what version of plugins can be loaded with what version of Qt and, and so on and so on. So it gives all the, uh, all the details. And uh, it's an overview that will point you to all the other parts of documentation that deal with plugins. And then, starting with 4.1, we also have a decent overview of how to extend Qt Designer through plugins. So that will come in a couple of weeks. And we, uh, then we have uh, some examples. There's a plugin paint and designer example I've talked about. And finally, the forthcoming chapter creating plugins in uh, C++ GUI programming with Qt4. Uh, due in June. So if you have questions, this is time to ask. Hello, Stefan Farmer, Max Planck, Cologne. We have developed an application which uses more than 50 plugins. We would like to port this to Qt, and um, for performance reasons, we would like to have more than 20 plugins in one DLL. Is that possible? I'm not aware that this is possible, the, of combining several plugins into the same DLL. Uh, so I believe that you have to kind of implement your own architecture for combining them, and then uh, a bit like we did in Qt with this uh, with these two layers, with one layer which is the plugin, and then interfaces. That one plugin creates the other ones. Okay, one here. Yes? Evgeny Druk, uh, um, Germany. Uh, are there any limitations of using plugins? Thread safety, signals and slots, event processing? Okay, so the question, yeah. Um, a priori, they aren't. Uh, once you're linking at the correct version of Q, uh, there aren't any limitations of that kind because, um, uh, because you basically you use the same Qt library and you use the same runtime and everything. So uh, it's not a problem. A typical problem that occurs with the uh, plugins sometimes is if 
you link against the wrong wrong time, then the memory you will allocate uh, won't be able to be fed by Qt or vice versa or by the application. But this problem doesn't occur if your setup is correct. So if you're linking, if you're building the, the plugin in debug mode and the application in debug mode, or both of them in release mode, then you're going to use the same runtime, so it's not a problem. Uh, and if you're not, then the Qt will refuse to load the plugin anyway because it checks that thing. So uh, you can do anything in a plugin. Um, a question for the export macro. When you look into the code, at least for Qt 4.0, I found that it's not thread safe. So you have a singleton there and uh, you have no protection. Sorry, the code for? For the um, oh. export macro, the function. Oh, that macro. Yes. Uh, yeah, I would, assume, I would assume that you have to load the plugins in the main thread. Uh, I'm not sure about that, but that might be a limitation. Okay. Uh, but beyond that, once you have created your interfaces, uh, well, in theory, it depends on how your class is implemented, but if, if your class is implemented in such a way that it can be used in any thread, if, it, if your class is thread safe, then you're fine. Uh, so then it's really up to you, once you have the interface, how you implement your class, whether it's thread safe or not. But you're right, maybe the plugin loading is not thread safe or cannot be done by, by, uh, from other threads. Okay, next question. Um, here, here, there, and there. Okay, cool. <laughs> okay, just a short question. Is there any chance to get plugins working with a static build of the application? Uh, I'm not aware of uh, any specific plans. I've noticed in the header file there seems to be some macro trickery that seems to point out in the direction that somebody wanted to implement that, but um, I'm not aware of anything. Maybe uh, I could check afterwards. If you come, uh, I'll find, maybe grab the people who know more and we can check. Yes? Uh, yes, I would be interested in uh, two things. Uh, I think it would be interesting to have introspection that I can ask in, uh, a plugin about to, uh, the interface it, uh, faces mm. it has and also about having signals and slots uh, on the interfaces. I yeah. think that would be really interesting stuff. Yeah, uh, the introspection shouldn't be too hard for us to implement, and I think you're the second person who asked for it. So I think, I mean, we have the information, just we don't have any API to make it available. When it comes to signals and slots, it's a feature I think that some, especially your Qtopia, uh, people at Trolltech are really pushing for. So uh, I think it's going to happen, not in 4.1, but possibly in, in 4.2 or 4.3. Uh, and basically, I think we know how we're going to implement it, and it's just a matter of uh, doing it. My name is Joachim Eibel from Roland Schwarz. Is it possible to safely unload a plugin so that, for instance, you can uh, recompile it, uh, fix some error, and reload it again? I think there's an unload function in Q plugin loader. Uh, I'm not 100% sure, but then that will make it possible if such is the case. Oh, this is a popular question topic. <laughs> Um, I've got a question to debug and release builds. Yeah. Um, you told that uh, if you have a release build, you cannot load a debug plugin. Right. That could be a problem because if you have a, say, big application with 100, 200, 300 DLLs, yeah. uh, it's on a machine somewhere, and then you, uh, the customer says, oh, there's an error. You have to fix that. You have to find that error, so you have two possibilities. You put one plugin in debug mode there mm. to test, or you have to put the whole application in debug mode. Yeah. It's, a, it's a limitation that we inherit from the, uh, from the compiler or the underlying technologies. We cannot do anything about that. Uh, for example, in Windows, we would link against two different runtimes, and that would cause crashes and all kinds of problems if you allocate memory in one and release it in others. Uh, so there's basically nothing that Trolltech can really do to address that on all platforms. Uh, so that's how it is. 
And there's also the problem, I think, that Q is not binary compatible in debug and release. And again, that's something that that's a bit because of the compiler, if I understand correctly. So it's, uh, it's beyond our control. Next question. John Sturton from the French company Sesquo. Ah, bonjour. Uh, hi. Um, you said that when you create the plugin, you give it a string ID, which is used to check the version compatibility. Yeah. If you want to do a later plugin, which then handles the older version of the interface plus the new version, how does your plugin framework handle that? What you would do then to handle both is that you'd create two uh, separate uh, interface classes. So instead of obsoleting one, you'd still keep both in the application. Maybe you'd make the new one inherit from the old one. You'd give different names to the classes, and you'd give different identifiers, of course, to those uh, classes. Uh, and then you can support old versions and new versions at the same time. So uh, it's a bit more work, but it's work that you have to do anyway. Yes? Another question. What about uh, mobile devices and plugins? Uh, what about them? <laughs> <laughs> is it possible to write plugins for Qt Embedded and for yeah, them? Yeah, Qtopia is a big user of plugins. They use them for uh, various things. And Qtopia Core or Qt Embedded use them for uh, the, uh, the different drivers, uh, the mouse and, and so on. So yes, uh, we're using them a lot. But I also think there's a, sorry to go back, um, think there's also different modes in Qtopia. So you can build it as plugins, or you can build it statically, or you can build everything as one big application, and so on. So it's just one of many possibilities there. My name is Oliver Noll from uh, Autoform, Switzerland. Um, if I have like 10 image plugins, are they loaded at runtime all at once, or just when needed? Oh when boy, uh, I'm not sure. I think they're loaded uh, when needed, or at least to a certain extent. I mean, the first time you create a Q image or something like that, I'm not sure exactly. Uh, it depends on how Q image is implemented. Um, I don't know. So, uh, but yeah, I don't think we have this big function in Qt that does all of this. So I, I would assume it occurs the first time. At some point or other, we're going to create a Q image, and then we're wondering, oh, what format is that? Then we need to create all the plugins to find out. So uh, I guess it practically always occurs at the uh, startup. Yes. Yeah. OK, well, then we'll call it good. <laughs> Thank you for coming. OK, thank you, Jasmine.